I, you know, maybe late summer, early spring, early spring, early fall, doing some, uh, doing some in-person things. We might try some outdoor events and, and see how that goes as people get more vaccinated, which I hope all of you are doing. Um, so stay, you know, stay tuned. Uh, this spring, ton of stuff coming up. I won't go through the whole list because we'd be here for a while, but we have several weeks in the next couple of months. We'll put a link here in the chat. You can see we have some weeks with four or five events a week. Um, so it's gonna be a really packed spring with something for everybody in there. I will make note of uh, the last half of May, early June. We are gonna be doing a series of events tied to the commemoration of the centennial of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. We have a lot of things going on there, everything from a conversation with Don Lemon from CNN. We're gonna be talking to Scott Ellsworth who wrote kind of the first major book on the, on the Race Massacre called Death in a Promised Land back in the 1980s. He's got a, kind of a new follow-up book to that. We're gonna be talking with Carol Anderson about the Second Amendment and its relationship to racial politics, uh, lots of different things on there. Um, so I would encourage you to go to our website. You can see all of those events and more. Um, tonight, I always enjoy it, of course, when I get to have a conversation with authors. I've gotten to do it so much, especially this past year, but it's always nice to be one of you, sit back and enjoy uh, as an audience member and, and take this in. So tonight, I want to first introduce you to our guest moderator, who will be Matt Sutton. And Matt is a professor at Washington State University. And he is going to be kind of sitting in as our um, uh, kind of, uh, what do I say, kind of a, you know, Mike Wallace, but not as much grilling, you know, maybe more of a, you know, a Terry Gross kind of figure. Uh, but Matt has written two books that I would certainly encourage you all to read, American Apocalypse, which kind of tells the story of American evangelicism, and then Double Cross, which is uh, kind of something quite different. You know, we're talking about spies and World War II here. It's, it's, it's something, but also how that ties in with missionaries and, and, and uh, you know, evangelical movement and all the different ins and outs of that. So Matt will be leading us tonight. Um, but I did have the great pleasure and kind of a, a little bit of a gut punch reading White Evangelical Racism by our special guest tonight, uh, Professor Anthea Butler. Um, this book um, is one of those things where you see the title and you think you know what you're getting yourself into. And I certainly kind of thought that, and then you read it and you realize it's something quite different. Uh, Professor Butler teaches at Penn in Philadelphia. Um, you've probably seen her on, you know, CNN, MSNBC, you've read her op-eds and articles in the Washington Post, New York Times, all over the place. Um, but when I was reading this book, just on a personal note, I've been reading a lot of books kind of in this area, of course, as we lead up to this spring. And it certainly touched on something where if you look at this last hundred years or so, and you say, in America, not all evangelicals have a race problem. That's certainly too broad of a picture. But if you look at people who have an issue or are racist in this country, very often, unfortunately, there is something tithing, that tying them to the evangelical movement very often. And that's something I hadn't quite seen before. And reading this book really opened my eyes to that. So I'm looking forward to hearing this conversation tonight. And I'm sure you guys will have lots of questions and I would encourage you to ask them. Uh, you can do that by putting them into the Q&A here and Matt will be pulling some of those as we go along and getting some answers for you. So. Thank you, Professor Butler, for doing this. Thank you, Matt, for, for uh, stepping in as moderator. I look forward to hearing this chat, and I will let you both take it from here. One thing, though, you got to get this book. And the only way you can get it from us, of course, is tonight by clicking in this chat and uh, picking up a copy through Magic City Books, your favorite nonprofit bookstore. The money supports us and also these great authors. So do that and uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, let me begin by just thanking Magic City Books for hosting this. Um, this, as soon as I found out that Anthea's book was coming out, I was super excited just simply to read the book and then even more excited when I was invited to help participate in this conversation with her. Um, I think I've, I've long been a, a fan of Anthea and her scholarship and her contributions. And so um, getting to chat with her about them with you all is something that I've, I've very much been looking forward to. Let me also thank the University of North Carolina Press for publishing this wonderful book. Um, they really did an amazing job with it. It's, it's gorgeous. It's 
an amazing read and the, the press just really did a first class job. And then let me also thank Jeff Martin for hosting this event and for making this possible. So I'm gonna begin by asking Anthea some questions, um, but let me, let me just ask you first, Anthea, what inspired you to write this book? What, what caused you to do this? Yeah, thanks. I, you know, there's a lot of things, but I think there were a couple of things that really stick out. And because you know me in a certain kind of way, I'm going to talk about a little bit of that. Um, I have an evangelical past. I feel like I'm telling like a testimony story right now, but I went to an evangelical seminary, Fuller, as a matter of fact, and those of you who are in Tulsa might know what that is. You at least know what ORU is, so that'll help you get on the radar screen. And my experience with evangelicalism was sort of fraught because as an African-American woman, I had several experiences that were not so great, but I had a lot of good experiences. But what I could never figure out and what always stuck in me was that, you know, how, for one thing, evangelicalism was always coded as white for politics, right? But that evangelicals sort of saw themselves as being colorblind and all of these things that sort of, you know, they talk about, you know, everybody is welcome. We want to spread the gospel. We want to do all of this stuff. And then the second part, I think, really started during the Obama administration, how evangelicals responded to him, how we got into birtherism and all of this. And a lot of you might think that this book came about because of Trump. It really didn't. It was to answer kind of a different question. And that was, how did we get to Trump? And I thought that that reason was racism. And the things that I've taught, where I've taught a religion and politics class now for probably almost 20 years since coming out of grad school, has been really interesting to me because race kept coming up more and more and more. And so I thought it was probably time to do this book. It was a moment in our country's history and present day that you know race has been a huge topic of conversation and how we wanna see history. And evangelicals have always been invested in writing a certain kind of history about themselves that's you know really nice and pristine and clean. And I'm like, but that's not really the history that's you know, 100% right. And I thought that someone else should take up the task of writing this history from a different perspective, but also telling some truth about the movement itself. Great. So I have a list of questions here, but I'm already ready to throw them out because I have yeah. a, a million just based on what you just said. So that, that was what, what is shocking to me is that we're in 2021 and only now beginning to talk about race and evangelicalism. And it really is only now, like there's not yeah. a book like this on the market. It's not like we've been yeah. dealing with this for 50 years. Can you explain why that is? Why do you think of, of this group of all groups, yeah. we have not dealt seriously with race and its history? Well, I think for there's there's a few reasons. So let me talk about the, the um, academic and historical ones first. There's a certain group of people who've written about evangelicals evangelical history, evangelicals, and to be specific, white evangelical men, uh, you know, the names Marsden and Noel and, and, and a whole host of people, Thomas Kidd and others, who have written this history about themselves. And it's been a great history. Oh, it's, you know, we were abolitionists. We, you know, defended the country. We, you know, we fought in world wars. We were against communism. We, you know, we fought against the culture. All of this stuff was one way to do this. Then there's another way to do this. And I call it the popular culture way about writing about evangelicals. And this is like people like Michael Gerson or Peter Wenner and others who sort of really started wringing their hands when Trump got in office because they were just like, I don't understand what, you know, why do we evangelicals like Trump? And so it was like this, this kind of whiny thing. And then the third part was evangelicalism is such a part of our culture, whether we, if you want to just think about it from the more majority forward, evangelicals have told a certain story about themselves. They've told a story that they were the holders of morality in this country, that they were the ones that were going to save the nation and, and had God on their side. And so I think it's not just about evangelicals writing a story, it's about the general public letting them tell that story and not confronting them about it and, and thinking about them in only a one dimensional way in terms of what evangelicals said they were against and not what evangelicals were actually doing and what the project was. And so I think the reason why we have these kinds of things is because they've never been challenged before. And they have a group of ancillary organizations that field a lot of money, which we can talk about later, into evangelicalism so they can tell this story about themselves and make sure nobody else touches it. Great. So one of the things that surprises me about that generation of historians that you just mentioned, 
is that they were writing in response to Jerry Falwell and the right of, rise of the religious right and the moral yeah. majority. And none of them were part of that. None of them liked mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And yet they were still reluctant to take on the issue of race. What, mm -hmm. what does that tell us about, about them and what they will touch and what they won't touch? It, well, it tells you that their worlds were right, white, first of all, and, and very white and male. And then secondarily, I think what it tells us about them is that they bought into that race story, okay? And so what I'm not accusing them of being racist, what I am saying is that they've constructed a narrative about evangelicalism that, you know, white people were always evangelicals. And if anybody of color came in, African-American, Asian, Latino, people from other countries, they were the missionary work, right? They were the people who we told the gospel to as opposed to people who could be evangelicals in their own right. And so I think that these men who told this story and, and a few women, you know, let's be fair, I think that they were wanting to control this story, but also wanting to write against Jerry Falwell and all the other religious right people that were there because they wanted to make themselves look apolitical when in fact the movement has always been political. Yeah, I think that's a key point. That's one of the things that has always shocked me about the histories of evangelicalism is this idea that there, there was this period where they were withdrawing from politics, where they weren't mm -hmm. engaged in trying to um, kind of impose their morality on the rest of the nation. And, yeah. and you know, it, it's, I think that's also part of the problem of the story they tell. And so in the middle of the civil rights movement, it also allowed people like Jerry Falwell to say, you know, we don't want Martin Luther King marching in the streets. Yes. Preachers are not called to be politicians. They should be soul winners, mm -hmm. which then in itself became a way to critique the civil rights movement and to stand against um, racial integration. Yeah, exactly. And and so this whole thing that they do, what, you know, you know this very well from Jerry Falwell's speech, Ministers and Marches, you know, where this goes into the 70s is, is in this sense of which they totally flip the script and say, wait a minute, this is, this is something that we can do. We can start to think about how we can be political, how we can move the needle. If, you know, if black people could do it, we can do this too. And so essentially, of course, everybody thinks this is about abortion, but it kind of really isn't. And, and that's the thing I think is very interesting about the story. Good, I, I wanna come back to abortion in a few minutes. We should also, um, I'm afraid to jump in too deep since I've read the book for the people watching, listening who haven't read the book. Why don't you tell us briefly kind of about the scope? Where does it begin? Where does it end? You know, what, what is this book about? Yeah, this book is about giving you the long view, giving you a history of evangelicalism in a different way. And so we start actually in slavery. We talk about uh, a present day event, actually, which is very interesting that happened while I was writing the book that, you know, it's one of those moments where you just, as a writer, you just go, thank you, because it was like the most perfect thing to start off a chapter about slavery with, right? But I go from slavery in the first chapter to reconstruction in the lost cause. And the second chapter, we start off talking about the rise of Neo evangelicalism and of course the big figure of evangelicalism Billy Graham um, we get into the third chapter where we talk about the religious right and and this formation how things happen in the 70s forward and how that really becomes a, a political power for evangelicals and then the last chapter we deal with I'm dealing with is basically from I like to call him and I think you all are going to have him in Magic City if not already uh, George W. Bush who is the great evangelical president right and talk about him and, and um, President Barack Obama, but I only touch just very slightly on Donald Trump. And I want to explain the reason why for that. I think that one of the things that you should know about this book is that while everybody asked the question about Donald Trump and asked about why evangelicals liked him, I thought that there was a different question to ask is that how did evangelicals get to Donald Trump? How did they get to Donald Trump in terms of their ideas about race and how they interacted with the culture and with politics and how they use morality as a way to get into politics and a way to you know, create these wedge instances of how they get power. So I think the scope of the book is really something that will help people understand the political aspects, not just the religious and moral aspects of evangelicalism and see how this has been a project of theirs almost all along. Great, thank you. So one of the things that we as historians always do is um, the kind of questions we ask and the kinds of stories we tell reflect issues that are that are present, that are current, right? Nobody, nobody studies history for just its own sake. It's, it's always about what history can teach us about today. And one of the things that struck me about your book is that we've heard a lot from sociologists um, in recent years about evangelicals and race and evangelicals and gender and evangelicals and lots of other topics. But again, you're 
breaking new ground here in talking about evangelicals and race and history. And I'm curious what you think is the benefit of history in helping us understand where we are today that differs from like sociology say. Yeah, I think history is really important because what you can see is you can see the, I, the longitudinal aspects of what evangelicalism have been doing. So let me take one thing as an example, I think that carries through throughout the book is the issue of the family, right? We think about evangelicals caring about the family, but we have to understand those constructions about the family happened in the reconstruction and you know redemption period of the 19th century. They really start in slavery too but especially in the South in the 19th century with the construction of white womanhood, what you think the family is, what you think the black family isn't, right? Mm -hmm. And how those things roll up into the 20th century when we start, you know, evangelicals start to talk about unwed mothers and, and all of these things that they wanna have happen or they talk about, you know, how uh, black people are having more abortions and we need to stop that. And we need to think about, you know, people getting married or same sex marriage. How do we think about that? And so this idea about the family carries forward from the first chapter in the book to the end of the book. And I think that's really important. So if you use history, then you can see how these things track over time. And I think the other important point for this is not just about family, it's about nationalism and how evangelicals think about Christian nationalism in certain kinds of ways in certain kinds of time periods. So that, you know, something that's not in the, in the book, January 6, the insurrection, right? You can see how that came about. You can, you, can, you can go, okay, I get how this probably happened and how people are praying in, you know, in the Senate chamber and invoking God as though they are saving the nation. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, 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 the Christian nationalism thing is something that I was aware of and I had written a little bit about, but not with the same kind of self-awareness that comes after January 6th. Like that, that absolutely transforms how I understand it and how I see it. Um, yeah. And I think the, the race is linked to that in ways that I'd never seen before, which again is one of the wonderful benefits of your book is helps us see that this was all hiding in plain sight. I mean, it yeah. wasn't even hiding, it was just there. Historians have just ignored it for, for way too long. Um, so I loved your first book on women in the churches of God in Christ. And this is a very positive book about these social activists, black women in the progressive era in the early 20th century who were really transforming their communities and, and using the Christian gospel to make positive change. I'm curious if you could talk about your own kind of intellectual trajectory and how you went from a very kind of affirming, uplifting, positive story to this much more kind of critical, negative. And they're both important. We need to tell both yeah. of them. But this is a, a big shift if you just put your two books together in terms of mm -hmm. your subject matter and, and what you're doing. So, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. It, it probably looks like on the outside it's a big shift, but maybe it isn't. And I'll, and I'll say why. It's not a big shift to me because there's two things that hold this, these two books together. And that's the issue of morality. And the question is, is how do people deploy morality and for what do they deploy it for? And I think, you know, in the first book, I'm talking about African-American women who are trying to navigate, you know, the urban, the urban space, right? In um, post, you know, 1915, whatever, and, and forward. And how they also had to navigate sort of a little bit about the reconstruction period. Mm -hmm. This book is about how people are using morality against other people to make something happen. And, and so to me, morality is the thing that brings them both together. Both of them are interested in politics, but how they get there is, is a different way, right? How, yeah. how people are doing it. But I think that the women in this book and probably, you know, some people in, you know, white evangelical racism, they'd be able to worship together. Now, the question is how, you know, how would they deal with each other outside of the church is the question. But I do think that what's interesting about both of these books is that they're held together by, you know, different ways about how people in groups deploy morality, how they see politics, how they see themselves in the social strata of America. And I think those three things for me, bring them two together. Now, let me say something about white evangelical racism. I think honestly, part of this for me and, and where I tell people, I'm like, I don't, I can't say, I hope you enjoy the book, but I think you should read it, right? Because it's, it's a, somebody said it was a compact but heavy read. And what they meant by that, it's, it's easy to read, but it's also packs a lot of punch about what's going on and why. And I think it's really important because I have a question underneath it. It's about, 
you know, will we still have democracy if these people get what they want? And I asked this question at the end of the book, do we still have democracy if they could succeed at all the things that they want to do in our society? Do we have a democracy? And I think for me, that's the fundamental question that lies underneath this alongside of, you know, the racism is like, do they even believe in democracy in the first place? And, and why did, you know, and how has that changed over time in part because of their, you know, the ways in which they, they exercise race and are willing to be, you know, sort of on the side of, of white people more than they are about the nation as a whole. Yeah, and that's one of the things that strikes me about the issue of democracy and political systems is if you read the evangelicals of the 1910s, 20s, 30s, and 40s, I think they're more honest, at least about that question, that they yeah. say, the Bible doesn't promote democracy. The Bible doesn't mm -hmm. teach democracy that, that, you know, it's just one political system out of many. And so that then justifies the kinds of political moves they're trying to make. Whereas um, modern day evangelicals, which I think is because they're much more nationalistic, they're so tied to it that they, they really can't, they can't separate themselves from the American system and from promoting the American system as this kind of ideal, even though they're undermining it in the very same breath. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that, you know, that part, and that's something I didn't really get to, could get to in the book because of, you know, having a, a, a limited amount of space. I think that's really important because that has shifted. And I think making that, uh, understanding that shift, you can understand that through their racial politics. Because the racial politics kind of are all the same. How they deploy those racial politics are very, are very different. And I, you know, I would almost say at this point, one of my friends said, you know, this book is about the Bible, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, kind of, but not really. Because, you know, what has happened in some of the discussions about this book is that people wanted to talk scripture with me. And I'm like, yeah, that's not the issue because a lot of evangelicals right now don't care about scripture anyway. So you, they only have you, they have you fooled. So if that's what you think, then they have you fooled because this is not about scripture. This is about power and authority and who holds it and who doesn't hold it. Right. So I have a quick question and then I'm going to pop off the screen because my cat is scratching at my office door and you all are going to hear him popping the door if I don't open yeah. the door. But, um, I, we but, don't want, don't strangle the cat. Okay. Yeah. No, I already told the kids like, be quiet. I'm on zoom. And, but the and cat does, the cat. The cats never pay attention to anything. Go, yeah, go take care. Of, go take care of the cat. But well, let me ask the question first. So you brought up Michael Gerson in that um, mm -hmm. it's struck me reading him throughout the Trump era. But this idea, and I've seen it before, like he's doing something we saw people doing in the 80s and 90s too, mm -hmm. which is to look back to the 19th century for a usable yes. past. And I'm curious, you know, if, if he was on this discussion with us, if he was on this Zoom, what would you say to him? Like if, if he tried to defend the kind of heroic 19th century abolitionist, women's rights activists in the 19th century, um, where is he wrong? Oh, he's so wrong. Uh, <laughs> so let me talk about why he's wrong. Um, you know, the, what he's referring to is a piece that I refer to at the beginning of the book by Michael Gerson about evangelicals. And it was in the Atlantic and I can't remember what year, maybe it's 2018 or something like that. That's beyond the point. If he were here, I would say, I'm blowing up your past because you're lying about the past. And that might be a little, little strong to say, but you can't talk about abolitionism unless you talk about slavery. And you can't pretend that these churches didn't split, even if you just take just a normal history of denominationalism and say, what happened? You'd have to talk about the Presbyterian split over slavery, the Methodist split over, over slavery, the, the Baptist split over slavery, which is why we have the Southern Baptists today yelling and screaming about critical race theory and losing all their black members because they don't know how to talk about this stuff, right? So that would be the first thing I would say. I think the second thing I would say to him is that what makes you look at history in this way and not see the racism? Because I think that would be my biggest question to him. It's like, how have you been blinded by what you believe is colorblind Christianity that, you know, what I say colorblind Christianity is basically is that you see white and you don't see anything else. And so I would, I would ask Michael Gerson, you know, how do you see this? If, if this is the only history you see for evangelicals, then how, how do you explain everything else? How do you explain the, the power? How do you explain the collapse of everything that you think it held dear with Donald Trump? You have to have a narrative that holds and your narrative does not hold. And so that's where I could blow the hole in his story. Yeah, and the thing that, um, so I wasn't gonna talk about my own research, but right before we came on and Thea told me it, that, was, that was okay. So uh, just for a second, one of the things that struck me is um, if we look at the revivalist Billy Sunday, who was yeah. incredibly popular in the 1910s and 20s, 
there was none of the books on Billy Sunday or on evangelicalism in that era talked about his racism. Yes. And part of it was because of the sources, because they were reading white sources yeah. who were not thinking about race because it was just assumed. Like that was, of mm -hmm. course, there was segregation. Of course, there was racism. And in their minds, of course, people of color were inferior, but they didn't have to say it because everybody knew it. Um, and when I started reading the black press, the black press's coverage of Billy Sunday's yeah. revivals, it was incredible. It was so different. Mm -hmm. and, and they would talk about the color line and they would talk about enforced mandated segregation. And they would talk about how Billy Sunday would come in and take on the bootleggers and the sex traffickers. But when it came to Jim Crow, he was a coward. Um, and it just, it, it blew me away to look at the kinds of sources that were out there that again, historians have just ignored for generation after generation after generation. Yeah, I, 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 and I, that's so true. And I think it's also, it's a question of training right now too. A lot of where evangelical historians got trained were in these kind of evangelical schools that fed these stories, right? And so it's just like right now, when you think about what are your sources? Well, how do you, how do you read the newspaper? Where do you get your information from? It's the same kind of information vacuum, right? So you, you read broadly across to see where, what is Billy Sunday doing in all of these kinds of you know arenas and periodicals most people are just like i'm going to read here because this is a thing that i know and i think what's important about that and about that story is that you could read my book this way all the way through about how you look at you know different phases of this so where i mentioned black evangelicals in the, in the late 60s and early 70s you know there's a whole there's a whole literature there that people didn't look at you could look at literature right now about people writing about evangelicals of color and nobody's really paying attention to that because so much is invested in these these figures who often are male and white and, and I keep saying that for a reason I think I say that because it's been very true and also those are the kinds of media people who have, you know, have gravitated to ask them questions, right? And so that narrative gets put forward in different kinds of ways as well. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's absolutely true. Um, so should we shift from one Billy to another Billy? Yes. Uh, Billy Graham? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I wrote an op-ed that appeared, it wasn't an op it, well, it was an article about Billy Graham that appeared within a few hours of his death. Mm -hmm. um, and I still get hate mail. Like that that's the piece that I've gotten more <laughs> angry emails, tweets, um, letters about. And the reason was because I said that Billy Graham was on the wrong side of the civil rights movement. And I think when I wrote it, it shocked people. And I think your book is gonna shock people as well. But can you talk a little bit about why there's this misperception of Billy Graham and civil oh, rights? Yeah, first of all, I'm gonna say I, I loved your piece and yeah. I knew you would get flagged for it. But I mean, there's a misperception because everybody thinks that Billy Graham has these interracial you know, revivals and that he was very kind. And if you go to the Bible Museum, I'll, I'll use this as a great example. The Bible Museum in DC, um, in the American wing, the 20th century wing, you see Billy Graham on one side and Martin Luther King on the other, and they're looking at each other as though they were partners in the civil rights movement and, in, and doing everything great in the 20th century. I'm like, this is such a crock of you know what. But it, it's, it's this moment in which we don't really interrogate Graham, Graham for who he is. So let me just start off by saying, you know, you, you all are in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're not that far away from Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas, W.A. Criswell's church, which is First Baptist where um, Robert Jeffers is at right now. That was one of the most racist Baptist churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. What church does Billy Graham join in 1953? He joins W.A. Criswell's church. Now in 1956, he invites you know, Martin Luther King to come pray at the beginning of his um, revival at Madison Square Garden. He doesn't ask him to speak. He just asks him to pray and give the invocation. You know, King thought that this was a moment, a rapprochement moment. So he writes to him later, a few months later and says, you know, I really hope you don't go and meet this you know, Texas governor and I, I forget Charles Price Daniel, I believe it is that is very racist. Don't stand on the pulpit with him. Don't stand on this dais with him. And of course, Graham goes like, I'm not doing that. That's my friend. And he does it anyway. I think we also have this idea about Graham that he had all inter, you know, integrated um, revivals. That was not the case. It depends on where you find him. And as time goes on, we realize if you start to read things that he is not you know, somebody who is for civil rights immediately. He doesn't like the civil rights movement. He doesn't like the marching. He doesn't like the sit-ins. 
he wants it to be gradualism. And then right after the 1963 March on Washington, he basically says, and I'm paraphrasing, and this is in the book, you know, it's not until heaven that little black boys and little white girls will walk hand in hand with each other. So in other words, his, his eschatological vision, his vision for, you know, black and white people being together is not on earth, it's in heaven. And so he's like, you know, y'all gonna have to stay right where you are. The other thing I think we have to talk about is his proximity to power and how he positions himself to be, you know, near the president. So he tries with Truman, it doesn't work very well. But when he goes from Eisenhower forward, he becomes very powerful and useful. Even though he doesn't like JFK, he gets close to JFK too. And that goes on down the line until I think the pinnacle for him basically is Nixon. And we all know how that turned out not very well for him. So that's sort of the first part of his life. And in the second part, he sort of tries to reform a little bit, but he still uses a kind of way of using, you know, the black friend or the black singer or the, the, the black person who comes up to give their testimony as a prop and a foil to him when he's on stage for revivals. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about those folks you mentioned earlier, uh, Skinner and some of the other black evangelicals from the 70s, and I'm looking, you dedicated your book, yeah, Bill Pinnell. Mm -hmm. um, how should we understand those folks, those folks who worked within the movement from the inside, yeah. hoping for change? Uh, vexed, <laughs> I, you know, and, I, and Bill Pinnell's still alive, so which is great. I mean, I think he definitely is someone who has had a lot of problems with him, with with evangelicals. I mean, there was a whole black evangelical association because white, you know, the NEA was not letting them in. So they had to create their own evangelical association where they were doing their revivals and meetings and all of this. And so in 68, you know, Pinnell writes this book, My Friend the Enemy, where he talks about, you know, you don't want me in your living room because you're hoping that I don't date your daughter. Right? So he's talking about this whole thing about miscegenation and, and the fears about that. But then Tom Skinner, who's also his friend and, and a big person in evangelical circles, both black and white, gives this big speech at Urbana in 1970 that is, you could almost say it was almost a template, although I didn't mean it that way, for the book, because he goes through a litany of what has happened with evangelicals from slavery forward to that particular moment. And it caused a huge stir at the Urbana convention. And then he ends up working with, you know, which complicates his story a little bit of critique about of evangelicalism. He ends up working with Chuck Colson, you know, on prison fellowship. And so this is like this moment where it's like they, they have to move in and out of these circles and they get to be there. But at the same time, it's always problematic for them because they're having to fight for who they are as African-Americans. But there's also an acquiescence to that structure of evangelicalism so that they are able to move and function as people within that. For some reason, I couldn't unmute myself for a second. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. Well, of course it's right, but um, it, it's a fascinating dynamic. And I, it, it makes me appreciate people who are willing to work on the inside for reform versus those who just kind of give up and walk away. Um, and yeah. I, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. Um, let me shift gears just for a second. One of the questions popped in here about comparisons between white evangelicals and Mormons. And I'm wondering if you could talk, um, and we'll talk about some more specifics of evangelicals, but if you could talk first about, is this an evangelical problem or is it a problem of other religious groups like Mormons in the United States? It's a problem for Mormons. I could have written, there, there's a couple books out for Mormon, on Mormons right now on LDS. One is Joanna Brooks, and I'm just forgetting the title right now. But, um, and there's another book, I'm forgetting is about 19th century Mormonism and race. Mormons, Mormons have an interesting history because, you know, in part, they get vilified and actually compared to Black people in the 19th century. What happens to them in the 20th century is very interesting because they move forward to try to do the same things that evangelicals are doing, which is, you know, get close to power. And so I, I still have a piece that I'm working on right now about one of the um, presidents of, of the Latter-day Saints who basically kind of goes through the same trajectory at the same time that Billy Graham is going through his, you know, getting closer to power and all this. And of course, you know, we all know that there was the, ba the ban on the priesthood against, you know, black men until 1978. I think that that's a real story for them. I, I have to say that you could probably write that story in some of the same way that I wrote this story. What complicates the Mormon story is how they have to think about immigration and where they've been and the kinds of missionary stuff that they did. 
and the, and the ways in which you know uh, Mormonism can trump race for certain races, right? So it you know it's always been hard for you know black people to be inter um, interracially married in Mormonism, not so much anymore. Religion of different color, thank you. Um, but it's it's not at hard it was at as hard for people who were like Hawaiian or you know in the Pacific Islanders and others. Where Mormonism cracked up, and this is this is a worthwhile thing to just say, is that you know the the ban had to fall fell apart because they were building so much in other parts of the world. And when people would bring their birth certificates and you would see somebody who was mulatto or of mixed race or had mixed race parents, and they had paid all this money to build these temples, then they had to realize that this was gonna be an issue for them and that they would build temples in places like South Africa and Brazil where race has a different kind of connotation than it does here in America. And so I think that was very problematic for them. And that was the beginning of change. They would say it was revelation, but I also think it was pragmatism. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Revelation is always can stand in for a lot of other other reasons um, mm -hmm. for evangelicals as well. And for the kind of Pentecostals that you and I have both also studied. So one of the things that I struggled with as a historian, and I, I talk about this when I'm teaching the civil rights movement to my classes, is we have the folks in the 1960s who were against the civil rights movement and they were explicitly segregationist, racist. I mean, there's nobody questions any of that. But then there's these folks who say, we actually believe in integration. We actually believe in racial equality. We just don't want the federal government mandating it. And, and you can actually trace that they have a long history of anti-statism, right? It wasn't that they suddenly became anti-government because of civil rights, that, that this is something they've held for 50, 80, 100 years, mm -hmm. kind of going back generations. But my question is really, in, in the Trump era has forced me to rethink some of my assumptions. Should we believe them? Should we believe people like Barry Goldwater who said, I'm going to vote against the civil rights movement, but I do want integration to happen. Mm -hmm. I think they wanted to happen on certain terms. And so, you know, somebody like Barry Goldwater, he's already out in the West. And so he's like thinking, well, of course I see, you know, I see Latinos, I see Native Americans, you know, but the, the housing covenants made sure that nobody black was going to live near him. Right. So it was, it was the structure that was around them. And so this is kind of gets to another piece of the book that I think is really important. I think for those people who say, well, this doesn't bother me. I want integration. I think they want it on certain kinds of terms and they want it in terms of, well, you know, as long as they don't marry each other and I don't have them as neighbors or whatever, sure. I'm happy for them to have a job. Sure. I'm happy to do this or whatever. But you know, when we get to, I imagine those same people like Barry Goldwater, if they were alive in 2008, when Barack Obama got elected, there's a sense in which there are certain things that are only for white people, right? And I think that's the idea behind this is that, well, you know, they're never gonna catch up to us anyway. So we can say we want integration. And I, I know that's a cynical way to put it, but the moment that, you know, Barack Obama, you know, laid out all of his bona fides, you know, all his degrees, everything, and he became president, this was an existential threat to whiteness. And it was also an existential threat to what, you know, white evangelicals especially had constructed in their head about, the, you know, people being less than the people who were actually, you know, worshiping with them and everything else. In other words, you know, we can be by them in church, you know, and I, I tell a story like that in the book, right? But it's it's not like I see them as being equal. Yeah, no, and the other the other way that this was always broken down when I've kind of read evangelicals is they also make a distinction, and this gets to the Mormon question also in terms of missionary work, that they're always they're always welcoming Africans into their homes. Yes. Like they're yes. happy to have people mm -hmm. from around the world, but they don't want African-Americans in their homes. Like that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a different category for them. And that's where you can see, um, there was a, a biography of Carl McIntyre, another fundamentalist leader from the 1950s yeah. and 60s and 70s. And I went round and round with the author of this book because he kept saying, Carl McIntyre is not a racist. He has these Africans at my house, mm -hmm. in, in, in his house. And it's like, no, 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 that's, that's yeah, something. It's different. a very different thing. And, and, what you, and what somebody like Carl McIntyre would think that Black Americans are versus Africans are, are two different things. Because, you know, the thing is, is that he would see Africans as being colonized by England or Germany or whatever, you know, and not thinking that deeply, but that they were different because they were not going to fight them, right? Yeah. And, and I kind of allude to, to this, this in the book, not about Africans, but about a certain way in which evangelicals, especially white evangelicals always think about, you know, African Americans as being in this role of being long suffering and docile and singing. And it's, it's a caricature 
unfortunately, and I, and I get to that just a little bit in the book, but it's this racialized caricature of what you think Black people should be. And then when you get to this reality that they're multifaceted people with all kinds of thoughts and, and different ways of thinking politically and socially, that becomes problematic for evangelicals. It's like they break down, they can't handle it. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And, and it is amazing, you know, when you talked about the singing, I mean, I, back to Billy Sunday, I mean, he, he wanted Black gospel choirs at his revivals, but he didn't want them sitting next to whites in the pews. I mean, it was just this total disconnect. Yeah, yeah. It's about authenticity. How do I look authentic as a, as a Christian? I'll have these people come and sing their hearts out, but I'm not going to let them sit next to anybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So another challenge that I've faced as a historian, and, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm changing on this, but I'm curious how you wrestle with it in the book, is how we when don't we take people at their word? So, you know, we could use the example again of the civil rights movement of Billy Graham mm -hmm. saying, I believe in equality, I believe in integration, but I just don't think the federal government's going to mandate it because we need Jesus to change hearts. We can't mm -hmm. force people to change. When do we say, no, he's a racist and he's lying to himself and he's lying to us. And when do we say he's wrong, but that's an authentic conviction? Yeah, I mean... I got to talk about that conviction in totality. So totality. So let me take both of those things. I think the first thing is when do we not take people at their word when they do the things that contradict their word, right? And so yeah. Billy Graham does things that contradict his word. And you know, maybe we, you know, if I had written this book 20 years ago, maybe I wouldn't know about some of the things that I know about him now. But I think, you know, when people's histories contradict what they say, then you have to you have to think about what is it that they're really doing? I think the second thing about this is that, you know, when he says, well, I'm really for this, but it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. I think what that also is about is a, is a sense in which you hide behind the belief or the theology in order to get you out of things. So in other words, I, evangelicals like to blame Jesus a lot for everything. Well, Jesus wants this, but it's just not right now. Or, you know, how, however they, they play this out, right? And so Jesus gets blamed for a lot of stuff. And, and what I'm trying to do is say, quit letting them blame Jesus for this, okay? You yeah. know, that, that Jesus is the reason why we, you know, why this hasn't happened or that if just people would just open up their hearts because we know that that's not the case. And we know that that doesn't work. And it's, it's, it's unrealistic to say that, but again, it's that moral kind of persuasion that evangelicals use to be able to push off the inevitabilities. And that's also about individuality versus structural racism. If I just think that it, you know, racism is individual, then I, of course I can say in my heart, I'm not, I'm not a racist, blah, 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 because nobody wants to call themselves a racist, right? right? But if you allow the structural racism to happen all around you and you're not doing anything about that, then I think that's a problem. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. This has been super helpful for me. We should have these conversations more often. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the debates historians have had, and you mentioned abortion earlier, um, is kind of what inspired the rise of the religious right. And, and as we talked about, evangelicals were always political, but they really haven't been partisan until the late 1970s when the, the Republican Party really made a concerted effort to, to draw evangelicals into the party. And then the question becomes, what, what made evangelicals susceptible to that move? And for a lot of folks, it was abortion. And I think more largely really gender. It was about the feminist movement and about kind of concerns yeah, right. about um, women challenging the kind of 1950s, 60s norms. Um, but you've stepped in here and talked about, no, it was actually Brown versus Board of Education. It was Bob Jones University losing its tax exempt status because it would not allow African-Americans to come to the university or college at the time. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between those two things or three things, if we think of three as abortion, gender, and race. Yeah, I, I think they're really important because they all tie into one big thing which is, you know, what, what do we do with our women, right? And so if you think about education and you think about this as being, we don't want integration, well, why didn't Bob Jones want integration? Because they didn't want to have interracial marriage, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's the first thing is like, you don't, you, you, you try to figure out how you're going to structure this. So, you know, you let Asians in first, you let a couple of black people in, it doesn't work, but you lose your tax exempt status because you want to be able to block out who can come into the school and who can't, right? Abortion is about, you know, two things. One is 
continued families, right? So, you know, you can think about this as continued white families. And, and, and that I think is especially true now, maybe not so much in the seventies, but it becomes this thing because of um, uh, Francis Schaeffer's, how then shall we live? And I talked just a tiny bit about that in the book, but I think that's part of an effort to think about women. But the third, and I, don't, I didn't get to this person a lot in the book, but I wish I had was Phyllis Schlafly. And I think we underestimate Phyllis Schlafly as a driver of, of evangelicalism in terms of what women should be doing, because she's a powerful figure who's not afraid to be political and say, you know, I'm going to fight this Equal Rights Amendment. And she mobilizes and makes the Eagle Forum and all of this. And I think it's very important to think about her as part of that force. But there's, a, there's another person that puts the glue all together. And I think it's worthwhile to talk about him. And that's Paul Weyrich, who's actually Catholic who you know, starts bringing these people together because he's been doing, you know, one of the founders of the Heritage Foundation, all of this. And he, there's, a, there's a moment where he's at this meeting, same meeting that Ronald Reagan says, you can't you know, endorse me, but I endorse you, um, where he basically says, I don't like, I don't want good government. I want that goo goo government. I don't want everybody to vote. And I'm like, bing, this is the moment where, you, where not only is, you know, are you thinking about these three things coming together, but it's the fact that we only want certain people to vote. And right now we are dealing with that same kind of attitude that was there in 1978. We are dealing with it in 2021 as people see, you know, Republicans see themselves losing power. This idea of let's limit who votes becomes a very potent kind of thing. And you wouldn't think about that as being religious, but it's a, it's a, it's a religious idea to make sure that you continue to stay in power. You know, because you, things could have gone another way. Evangelicals could have said, you know, Jimmy Carter is our kind of guy, right? But that's not what they said. You know, they were willing to hang their hat on, you know, divorced Ronald Reagan, movie star, right? And, and people back then probably thought that that was really weird. But then we get up to, you know, thrice married Trump. And then, you know, Ronald Reagan looks like nothing. Yeah. Let me, um, so there's a couple questions that have come in. There's one I want to save towards the end. It's, it's a great question that I think kind of summarizes this, okay. but let me, let me jump to another one. Uh, Jessica asks, is colorblind upbringing similar in some ways to the moral purification of white women in white evangelical family structures? So I guess it's kind of this idea of, you know, when people say they're colorblind, is that also the idea of the moral purity that movement within evangelicals? Well, I think when I'm saying colorblind, I'm thinking about two things. One is, you know, I don't see race, but I, obviously there is a hierarchy of race for me. So that's that's one. So this colorblindness allows you to bring people in, but it doesn't operate in those ways. And I think one of the, the ways I can describe this is the, the sort of um, the um, articles that have been coming out in the New York Times and the Washington Post about black evangelicals leaving churches, especially during the pandemic because them of not, you know, having their needs met in certain kinds of ways and experiencing really deep racism in the 2020 election cycle. I think the other part of this that is, is intriguing that you're asking is about you know, white women and whiteness. And I think that <clears throat> in a way you can't help but see this because of the ways that purity plays out for evangelicals, okay? And what I mean by that are all the purity balls, all the, you know, the ways in which you, you, know, you construct this in terms of virginity and, and all of that kind of stuff. I actually just showed my class last week about a black woman who gave her purity certificate to her father at her wedding and she was actually on Good Morning America. And it was just like one of those moments where I was just like, I can't believe this, this was is happening. Or this was uh, yeah, that, yeah, I'll send it to you afterwards. Yeah, this was like a couple of years ago. She has two kids now and her husband is like a gospel music star. But yeah, it was a big deal at the wedding. And she said, you know, my hymen is unbroken. And I was just like, you know what, this is too much information for me. <laughs> and then my students are just like, what is this, right? But I think it's really important to understand that even though these things can code white, that they get superimposed on people who want to stay in the midst of these structures. And that's what I, you know, that's the move I'm really trying to help people understand is that it's not just about white, you know, evangelicals or racists. It's about how does this certain kind of racism and, pra and, and moral practice influence other people to fall into this cultural sort of space and not question what's happening and not question it on a, a basis of scripture or anything else. How do they not see what's happening to them? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's complicated stuff. And I, I think I'm looking forward to that video, but maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> so 
is the term do you would you use the term black evangelical or is that a, a paradox you know i would just because i would use it historically okay. because i because they would refer to themselves that way i think what's paradoxical now is that they don't it's it's really difficult for them to have a space to be in and and what i mean by that is you know you have mega churches that consider that are you know are integrated or you know interracial churches and all of this stuff now and so the need to say i'm this kind of evangelical may have fallen apart however Right now, the president of the NAE, the National Association of Evangelicals, is an Asian American man. This has become very important in terms of what is happening right now with, you know, the persecution of Asians Ameri Asian Americans and receiving all kinds of death threats and being beaten up in the street and everything else. I think what the, the issue will become is twofold. One is what I've seen happening, especially during the Trump era, is that people were willing to say, well, there's not just white evangelicals, there's evangelicals of color because they wanna redeem the movement, right? And I'm like, eh, I think you gotta not do this because I don't know if this is redeemable for you. And then second, when people go to that appellation, I always wanna ask them, well, what makes them different and what makes them not receive this, this racism that has happened in the movement and the history? How has that racism affected them? You know, somebody like Tom Skinner or Bill Pinnell wrestled with that. I'm asking, can you be can you be an evangelical of color right now and not wrestle with the racism that is inherent in the movement? Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. So let me kind of lump together two questions that have come in from people watching, which is the question of, is there any hope and or where do we go from here? Is it possible to reclaim Jesus? And I'll put it in, in my own words, which is something that I've, so I try not to disclose too much about myself in public settings, just because I like to focus on the work and not me. But like Anthea, I grew up as an evangelical as well and still have deep connections to the evangelical movement. I've given up. I, I have no hope for the movement's redemption. I'm curious though, if in writing this book, if you still see a way forward, if you do still have hope for the movement or if, if we're done. Well, I'm going to make you laugh because I'm going to say, um, I left, <laughs> and you know I left. Um, and do I see hope? I think some of this has got to die. I, I'm just going to be really blunt about it. I think it's got to die. And and part of the reason why it's got to die is like some of the leaders are already dying. That's terrible to say, but it's true. This is what happens to us all. But secondarily, some of it has to die because it's killing us. And and I do mean that, and and not just a you know a, a flip kind of way. Let me give you an example of what I mean. 30%, I believe 30, 35% of evangelicals right now don't want to get a, a, a vaccine, right? So we're in the middle of a pandemic and we have people who wanted to meet in church the whole time, despite, you know, capacity limits and everything else, and also don't want to get vaccinated because they believe that, you know, either a chip is going to get shot into them or something else, or that, you know, Jesus is going to take care of them. That does not help the public health right now, okay? Um, we had some of these evangelicals decided to, you know, take over the Capitol. And I'm beginning to ask myself the question, is this movement viable anymore? Is this you know, a group of people who have moved over into something else altogether than just regular Christianity? And I think for a, a good number of them, given the ways of people been voting and what they have said, the answer is yes. And so, yeah, I, I, have, my, I have some reservations about whether this is gonna work out or not for them. What I do think is that younger people are not buying the old stuff. And I think that's really true. You can look at the Pew surveys about people, the nuns who are people who don't have any kind of religious affiliation are, are going up in numbers, people who are leaving evangelical churches in numbers. And I think it's really important for us to understand that the religious landscape is shape, shifting. The question is, is that are you gonna allow evangelicals to still maintain the political power that they have by using the same old games that they have been for the last 200 years? And yeah, I think and that's the question. And it is, and I, I would like to hear your answer to it because one of the things that struck me is when Falwell shut down the moral majority in 1987, there were a bunch of articles by journalists about the end of the religious right. And then we saw the rise of the Christian coalition and the election of George W. Bush. And then with mm -hmm. the rise with the election of Barack Obama, once again, we had all these obituaries about the end of the religious right. And then we had Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, so is there finally enough change among young people? 
that we aren't going to see a new resurrection after Joe Biden, or is it going to come right back? I think I don't think it's gone. And as a matter of fact, I think you got Frankenstein. And so this is actually Frankenstein is worse because you've got a, a you know you've got a mutant creation right now that's pretty dang mad that thought that their president won and didn't win. Um, you know whether or not those were all evangelicals remains to be seen in terms of how you count them, but I think that they're not going away, and I think that organizations like you know Turning Point, Campus Reform, Leadership Institute that are training a young generation of Republicans who sort of have you know a, a religious kind of fervor that's sort of evangelical, right? If we think about Jerry Falwell Jr. and what he's been doing, but now he's being sued by his own father's university. You know, he had Charlie Kirk there. So this is like this very interesting sort of marriage between this political organization that also is in trying to push back against the universities, but also sees itself as an arm of the Republican party. So how can a young man like Charlie Kirk get all the power that he has, but yet still appear at churches? He just got canceled from a church because they were afraid that you know they got death threats or something, right? But Charlie Kirk is the new version of Jerry Falwell Jr. and Sr. But he's just a lot more savvy and he's a lot different in how they, in how they do things. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. So can you also talk a little bit, I, I worry about you, um, honestly, seriously, because you do say these important things and I know you take a lot of heat for it. And I'm just curious how the reception has been to this book and you know, if, you're, if you're getting you know, lots of support and encouragement, which is what yeah. I hope, but what I fear yeah. is that that's not what you're getting. Yeah, I, I get a lot of support and encouragement. I, as I said, I told people, I said, I think that once people figure out what this book is about, you know, people who are politically savvy and understand will go yes. And I think people who are evangelicals who are very much on the hard right are going to hate it. And I, I knew that going in, but I also made sure to do one big thing that I think is really important, which was to leave out Trump and to sort of put that kind of evangelical appeal at the end, which I'm sure you were like, I can't believe she's doing this. But, you know, I did it in part because I wanted people to see like, you're not the good guys anymore. And I don't think anybody's ever told you that you're not the good guys anymore, the good women. You're not morally superior to everybody else. As a matter of fact, you're morally inferior to most of what's going on in this country right now. And you're on the wrong side of things and they need somebody to tell them that. Now the question becomes, you know, will they like it? Probably not. Um, I would say, you know, as a, as a veteran of debt threats and people calling my institution all the time and, and doing all this stuff, none of that ever gets better. But I do think we're at a kind of a critical moment right now where, you know, any evangelical who's, who, who has bought into all of this that could at least read this book and say, oh, maybe this doesn't make me look so good, that I hope that it might reach somebody. I hope that, you know, somebody out here, you know, right now you've got an evangelical relative and you're trying to figure out what to do with them, just put that book on their chair. You know, the next time you go have dinner at the house or leave it on the porch or send it to them anonymously and, and let them sit down and read it and let them figure it out. I mean, I, I'll tell this story very quickly on, on, on someone I know. I gave it to one of my former seminary professors and he gave it to a very big denominational leader who was mad at first and said, I don't want to read this. This is horrible, blah, 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 blah. And then they started reading. They're like, oh, I do need to read this. So, yeah. you know, I don't know what the end upshot of it is. I, I suppose I'll hear. But, you know, if I, if I have some guy come into my door from the middle of the country, you could probably guess where it might be from. Yeah, no, I, I do think, I mean, so we're just about at the hour. So the book, again, is Anthea Butler's White Evangelical Racism. Um, thank you to to Anthea for this wonderful conversation. I hope for those of you who are tuning in that this was worthwhile and that it just got you very excited about the book. Um, go out and buy it, buy it from Magic City Books. Thank you also to Magic City Books for hosting this event. Um, this has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it's been fun for all of you. Um, and Anthea, congratulations. It's an absolutely Thanks, wonderful book and I'm looking forward to teaching it for many, many decades to come. I mean, it's, it's a book that's gonna be important for a long, long time. Great. So thank you everybody and thank you Anthea. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. <laughs>